This question that we're going to be addressing in our Bible class is very simply. Jesus asked a question, and you can read it for yourself in the book of Matthew in chapter 22, where Jesus says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And so, as I said, we need to understand some things if we go back in our text. Go back in your Bibles in the book of Matthew in chapter 22. I want you to notice that verse 15, where there the Bible says, The Pharisees, they went and they plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Now, there are two pronouns here. One of them is italicized. I think it's added for emphasis, but he's talking about Jesus. When I see those, you know, to me, that's a Bible help. That's a reference to deity. So we're talking about Jesus and the Pharisees and the religious leaders. As a matter of fact, if you look at Luke's account, Luke's account says that they sent spies who pretended to be righteous, that they might seize him in his words. Now, we don't always know why people do what they do. That's motive. But I like it when the Holy Spirit tells us why people do what they do. You see, all people are not serious Bible students. People who ask Bible questions are not always sincere in the questions that they ask. But I like it the way the Holy Spirit reveals this to us. And of course, we know Jesus knew what was in man, so they're trying to trap him. They're trying to ensnare him, so to speak. And I want you to notice, of course, Jesus carefully how he understands what was in man and where they coming from, as we say. The Bible says, and so they sent to him their disciples. Let me say this. A disciple is a learner. You could be a disciple of anybody. A disciple is one who is open and teachable. But being disciples of Jesus Christ, remember, we are taught by the Lord. We are taught by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that was given to the apostles that is in God's word, you see? So we are disciples, not only disciples, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We are learners, you see? So their disciples, those learners, he says, they sent their disciples with the Herodians. Now, when we think about the Herodians, this was a political group who took their name from Herod the Great and who sought to promote the subjection, listen, to Rome even above obedience to God. And they had been concerned about the rising influence of Jesus. And so they are attempting to do something about it. So we know where they're coming from. So look at what they said. They said, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Now, I ask myself the question, how could they say that? I mean, how could they say you teach the word of God in truth? I mean, did they really believe that? Well, obviously not. It's almost as if they're saying, we know you teach the truth, but we're not going to listen to you, and we're not going to do what you want us to do anyway. That's the way some people are, folks. Sometimes you can tell where people are coming from when they're not interested in the truth. And so I want you to notice at verse 17, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and superscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to God the things that are God's. And when they heard, their, heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. In your study of the scriptures, you know who used the word hypocrite over and over again? It was Jesus. I would suggest that we be careful about how we use that word. A hypocrite is one who pretends to be righteous. A hypocrite is one who pretends to be something that they're not. And when I go back and I think about these people who were pretending to be righteous, who are the people who pretend to be righteous? Well, sometimes you see those people today. Sometimes these are the people who might, quote, unquote, they come to church. Sometimes these are people who don't come to church. People who pretend to be righteous. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't do what they're told to do. They act like they're righteous. They act like they're a Christian. They act like they're a disciple. One way, perhaps when they come to the building, 
but they're totally different when they leave the building. You see? But Jesus called these people hypocrites. He understood. They were trying to get him in a trap because if he answered one way, he would be in trouble with the legal authorities. If he answered another way, then he would be in trouble with the Jews. And so his answer was simple. And I think it's something that we as brothers need to understand today. I know people have questions, especially about our government and the fact that our government has failed us. Jesus says, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Do you know what we have a responsibility to do when it comes to civil government? We have a responsibility to pray for them. We have a responsibility to obey them. And please keep in mind that some people are going to be condemned because they speak evil of dignitaries. And so I think that means that we need to be careful about our speech because we have influence. And if we are going to influence people for the cause of Jesus Christ, we better be careful about our influence in the political arena. And I'm going to say something about that a little bit later. We need to obey civil government. We need to pay our taxes. We are told specifically how to respond to civil government. Israel lived under theocracy. It's not a Bible word, but the concept certainly is. God regulated their religious affairs. God regulated their home life. God regulated their civil affairs, their religious affairs, their home life. God does the same with us today. We have a responsibility in every single area to recognize what God has said, and we must obey God rather than man when God's laws are in conflict, or I should say man's laws, are in conflict with God's laws. And so Jesus answers a question. And so I want you to notice in verse 23. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, they came to him and they asked him. And so for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to say this. Jesus simply responded to this hypothetical situation. Look at verse 29. He said, you are mistaken. You err in not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You know what that tells me? A person could be religious, but they could be wrong. It tells me again that people could ask questions and they're not sincere in their questions. When I look in the book of Acts in chapter 23, at verse 8, these Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't even believe in spirits. And you know what Jesus does? He speaks about the reality of each of these. Because he says, look at verse 30. He said, for in the resurrection, he says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. We're talking about spirits. He says, angels. He says in the resurrection, it's a reality. And what Jesus does is he goes on to prove from the tense of a verb, from a statement that had been made 1,500 years earlier. Remember with Moses and the burning bush. As a matter of fact, you look in Mark's and Luke's account, it says the burning bush passage where God said to Moses, when Moses says, well, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am. And so the point is, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And the implication is that even though Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and those patriarchs have died, they are still alive because there is life after death. And one day our bodies are going to be raised. And we'll talk about that, Lord willing, on Tuesday night. There'll be some questions. Be, I know a lot of people don't know what happens when you die. But when we raise questions, well, we need to at least be honest in the questions that we raised. These people didn't believe in a resurrection. But I want you to notice when Jesus spoke, un, spoke unto them, look at verse 33, and the multitudes heard this and they were astonished at his teaching. And then look at verse 34. And what, when, the, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, and again, the Holy Spirit is helping us to understand their motive. They weren't sincere. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
and they couldn't answer. I am told that there were over 600 laws, statutes, and commandments. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, was the basis of all the law that God had given Israel. And again, a theocracy. Those laws, statutes, and commandments regulated all of their lives. And I think some people today, there are many people today, as an article, that is still, a, lot, a lot of people today don't understand that we don't live under the Ten Commandments law. It wasn't just the Ten Commandments. There were other laws and statutes that were given to Israel. Those laws were never given to us. We don't live under the Ten Commandments law. But Jesus talks about a law that is the fulfilling of all the laws. And that is love for God. Supreme. And basically, I think we ought to commit Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to heart. That's the great commandment. Because if you love God, let me tell you what, you're going to do what God says. If you love God with all, I'm going to tell you what, folks, you'll understand his love. you comprehend his love. you comprehend with the concept of love itself. And you render obedience unto God because of his great love. And so the record tells us that after they come, when they pose this question, Jesus answered them as well. And so look at what Jesus says. When the Pharisees were gathered together, verse 41, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And so he said to them, Well, how then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. Well, he couldn't answer this without exposing their own hypocrisy. <laughs> And I like, you know, the way the Bible is made up. You know, the book of Matthew said to be written to the Jews, and you find a lot of Old Testament quotations in the book of Matthew. Being written to the Jews, they should have been familiar with the Scriptures. These Jews who questioned Jesus, they should have been familiar with the Scriptures. They should have been familiar, for instance, with verse 44, which is italicized oftentimes when you see those Bible quotations. In verse 44, they should have recognized what the psalmist says in Psalm 110. And so when Jesus posed this question, what do you think about the Christ? It was Jesus who was asking them that question. The word Christ equates with the Messiah. Look in your Bibles in the book of John in chapter 1 and verse 41, the encounter of John's disciples being introduced to the disciples of Jesus. And they said, we found him, the Messiah, the one that Moses wrote about. Now, Moses wrote about the Messiah as well. There are a lot of passages in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy in chapter 18, for instance, the same passage that Peter quotes in the book of Acts 3.22, the same passage that Stephen quotes before they stone him to death. The book of Acts chapter 7, verse 37. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things that he shall say unto you. And whosoever shall not hear that prophet shall be cut off from amongst the people. In the Old Testament, folks, specifically, when prophets or priests or kings were anointed. That's basically what this word means. It means anointed, chosen. When prophets, priests, and kings were anointed, chosen by God, oftentimes oil was poured on them so people would know that this was the one that was chosen by God. May I suggest to you that Jesus is prophet. He is priest and he is king. And, of course, that's what the Hebrew writer illustrates as he begins his book. God in sundry time and divers ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. But in his last days, he has spoken us through his son. Jesus is God's final spokesman. Came from heaven. Communicated to us God's word. In the book of Hebrews, he, he sets forth Jesus as this great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He speaks of greater things, better things, the law, for instance, and how Jesus brought forth another law, a greater law, a better law, because he's king, he's sovereign. And so, of course, we open up our Bibles, we can understand this. He is the Christ, whether the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the Herodians, or anybody else. 
Even if you are in this audience today, if you don't understand that Jesus is the Christ, the evidence is still here. The religious leaders of all people, because of their familiarity with God's word, there are specific, precise, minutely detailed prophecies of the Messiah's coming, which were filled in Jesus Christ. And so, having answered the questions from the Jewish opposition, Jesus raises a question himself. What do you think about the Christ? Of course, if you look in your Bibles in the book of Mark in chapter 14, before his crucifixion, remember the high priest asked him, and he said unto him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? It's interesting to study the scriptures. And you know, they were asking Jesus question after question, you know, on this mock trial. And it's interesting to remember when Jesus answered. False witnesses came. He didn't say anything. He answered them nothing. But then when they asked him, are you the Christ? He could not deny himself. And the truth that he is the Christ testifies to his sonship and thus his deity. Remember, Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And there were various responses. It wasn't the fact that Jesus had an identity crisis. He knew who he was. I mean, you look in the Gospel of John. Again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are sometimes, they're called a synoptic gospel because they're somewhat told alike in a chronological order. But John's account is a bit different. John reveals the seven signs of Jesus, the seven I am's of Jesus. And these, these seven I am's of Jesus help us to understand his deity, who he is. And then we're who do you say that Jesus is? Well, some say John the prophet, some say the prophet, some say Elijah. Well, who do you say? Remember, Peter was the one who spoke up. Peter said, that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. How could we know that? Because God has revealed it to us. In the book of John, in chapter 11, verse 27, remember Jesus waited until Lazarus was dead. And the sisters greet him on the way. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus said, did not I tell you your brother was going to rise? There again, the certainty of the resurrection. And Martha said, yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come forth into the world. You look in John's account. John tells us why he wrote, even though it's distinct from the synoptics. John says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe and believe and you might have life in his name. Can I suggest this, folks? You can, if you study with somebody, you're trying to help somebody to understand who Jesus is. Do you know what you can do? All you need to do sometimes is just look at the life of Jesus told from four different perspectives. Four different perspectives. People sometimes call those biographies. Four different writers. But I'll tell you something else. You open up the book of Acts, and you read throughout the rest of the Testament. You know what you find? You will find other people who spoke about the resurrected Christ. Even though he was dead, he's still living. And they went out into all the world, and that's, the, that's what they did. They preached him. In the book of Acts in chapter 8, here is an example of conversion. A lot of people don't know what to do in order to be saved. That question is asked. What do I need to do in order to be saved? And people are telling them all different kind of things. And I think what that helps me to understand, and it ought to help you to understand, when we're teaching people, people have questions. The eunuch had questions. He comes to Philip. Or oh, Philip comes to him, I should say. And he said, what you reading? He said, well, I can't understand what I'm reading unless somebody help me. Well, don't you know that's the way it is? And, and that's why these series of lessons, folks, question. People have questions in the world. We got the answers. 
God gives us the answers. Remember what Jesus said in John 6, 44. He says, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him and I will raise him up in the last day. Listen, it is taught in the scriptures. Everyone that comes to me must be taught. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him. I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Whosoever has heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. The distinctive nature of the Lord's church is teaching. A person needs to be taught. Taught about salvation. Taught about worship taught about the organization of the church, taught about what the church ought to be doing. And I'm not talking about the bill. I'm talking about the people. But even more than that, taught about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Lord. And that question is going to be raised in our next lesson. The word Jesus, of course, Helps us understand why he came to this earth. He shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then lastly, in the book of Acts in chapter 9, at verse 20, Saul, the one who wrote the majority of the New Testament, remember after he was converted, what was one of the first things he did? He straightway, or he immediately preached Christ in the synagogues. And what did he preach? That he is the Son of God. Now, you got your Bibles open, right? Acts chapter 9. I heard those pages turn. Drop up to verse 6. Look at verse 6. And if you got the Bible help, what you're looking at are the words of Christ in red, right? And you know what you've got? You've got a conversation with Saul of Tarsus, one of the persecutors of the Lord and his people, after Jesus has been crucified and resurrected and exalted to heaven. He is communicating directly to Saul of Tarsus. And incidentally, this is what's going to allow him in order to become an apostle because in witnessing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he is a chosen vessel. Those are the two requirements to become an apostle. But he says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He says, who are you, Lord? What is the answer? He says, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. Saul knew the scriptures. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew the scriptures. He was zealous and he was misguided. But when he came face to face with Jesus, look at verse 6. Lord, what is it you want me to do? I'm trying to help us to understand, folks, that when we come face to face with the truth, we need to be honest enough to recognize it for truth and accept it. What do you want me to do? The Lord didn't tell him, go say the sinner's prayer. The Lord didn't tell him, just believe. The Lord said, you go in the city to be told you what you must do. So he followed those instructions, and God communicated to somebody, like God might communicate to us, to help somebody learn the truth. And Ananias just confirmed, we were talking about the same man, and Ananias went and he said, Saul, Saul, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus. So I ask you, is baptism necessary for salvation? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Why? Because Jesus commanded it. Because the apostles preached it. Because it's a Bible truth. Because if we expect to be saved... We're going to have to obey the gospel just like Saul did. And many passages indicate that. So what think ye of Christ? I mean, whose son is he? And so, I think interestingly, the nature of the question that was posed by Jesus focuses not on whether they think he is the Christ, 
But what do they think about his lineage? I mean, what's the word of God reveal? The scriptures reveal who he was. But what do you think about what the scriptures say he is? Whose son is he? To the Jews, sonship meant equality with the father. I mean, you look in your Bibles in the book of John in chapter 5, at verse 17. John in chapter 5. I want you to notice that verse 17. And of course, Jesus further goes on to talk about some signs that would indicate who he is. John chapter 5, specifically verse 17. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. You know what, folks? They understood some things that some people today don't understand. I'm talking about some people who call themselves God's witness. They have their own Bible called the New World's Translation. And you know what? They don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. As a matter of fact, they don't even believe and accept the deity of Jesus Christ. In the New World's Translation, this is what it says. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was a God. You can take the King James Version. You can take the New King James Version. You can take the New American Standard Version. You can take the American Standard Version. Four reliable, at least, translations. And you can find this in John's account. In the beginning with the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, let me help you understand some things about God. If you go back in your Bibles in the book of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word there, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the Hebrew word there is Elohim. But even though it's a singular word, it's a reference to the nature of God, the divine nature, or what is sometimes referred to as the Godhead. It refers to the fact that God the Father was there in the beginning, that God the Son was there, and God the Holy Spirit was there. Because Genesis 1, 2 says, and the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. And the living word, the incarnate word was there. The word become flesh, John says in John 1, 14, and dwell among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten full of grace and truth. That same Hebrew word in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, Elohim, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. Those plural pronouns is a reference to deity. So we're talking about the eternal nature of God. Sometimes little children say, well, daddy, mama, what is God like? Well, let, let me tell you, God has manifested himself as the creator, as our father. Jesus Christ himself, creator. He was in the beginning with God before all things were created. Without him, nothing was created that was created. And you'll find in the record, and I think I may be preaching my next lesson, that he is the creator. He's God. He is the Son of God because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have heaven. Why did he send his Son? The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. God had this plan in his mind before the foundation of the world. This is the consummation of that. He is the Son of Man. Remember? Again, going back to the book of Matthew in chapter 16. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? That speaks about his humanity. He's the son of David. Look at the genealogy in the book of Matthew. Look at Luke's account in Luke in chapter 3. The Jews had access to that. If there were any difficulties, they could have brought it up then. They could have searched themselves, and no doubt they did. But they failed to understand that this Jesus, who was brought up in the home of Joseph and Mary, according to the lineage, was a direct descendant of David. Son of Mary, the son of Joseph. So whose son is he? 
So how is he David's son? How would you answer that question? Well, you go to the scriptures, just like Paul obviously did, Saul obviously did. He would go to the scriptures, and he would prove where did he come from. Well, he says, as far as his humanity is concerned, as far as his deity, he has always existed because he is the eternal God. David acknowledged Christ as his Lord. What do you mean? Well, David was inspired. I mentioned a 110th psalm. Go back and look at that Look at that psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord said to my Lord. How could David call him Lord? Well, they couldn't answer that question without acknowledging who Jesus was. Oh, they could have, but they wouldn't. Without exposing their hypocrisy. So let me ask you this question as I close. What do you think about the Christ? Don't you know we have to answer that? And I'm not just asking you, what do you think? Do you think whether he is the Christ or not? You know, some people have their minds already made up. I don't know. There are some people today who don't know who Jesus is. Do you know that there's a religious group who call themselves the Jesus people? These people believe that there is only one God, and they believe that his name is Jesus. They don't understand the concept of God. They don't understand who Jesus is and why he came. And again, there are some people who believe that there's only one God, his name is Jehovah, and that Jesus is just the first of Jehovah's creation. And that's not true either. There are some people, like the Jews, who believe that when Jesus did come, he failed in his mission to set up his kingdom, and so the church was established, and he's going to come back at another time, and then he's going to come and renew or restore Israel. But you know what that's like? That's like the teaching and the belief of those who are premillennialists. It's simply a failure to understand the spiritual nature of the kingdom. And a very popular religious body today, Islam. Islam does not believe in Jesus. Islam does not, Islam does not respect Jehovah. They don't even accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus was just a prophet, just a good man. And they got their minds already made up. What do you think about the Christ? Some will ignore the evidence. The evidence is here. Where he came from, why he came, what he did. Can I say this? Jesus did not come here to raise man's level of moral righteousness. Jesus came here to save us from sin and to face the horrible consequences of our choices in life to help us to understand that we don't want to go to hell and that he has made it possible by his blood that was shed at Calvary that our sins can be forgiven and we can have new life, life with God through Jesus Christ. And some were glad to receive that word. And they will recognize it as good news. And even though I've done wrong, that there is a God who is patient and long-suffering and good and kind, a God who knows me, a God who understands me because he created me in his own image. And he's trying to transform me in my life and my thinking and my whole being. So I could be like him. So I could live with him. In eternity. So what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? He's the Lord. Jesus Christ. And hopefully I'll answer some other questions related to this in our next lesson. I thank you again for your attention.